Okay, all right. Good afternoon. Delmer and I are here today. It's Friday the uh, 12th of February, uh, my sister's birthday today. And uh, so we're here today in room 111, 112, and we're uh, presenting today the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, February the 14th. This is lesson number 11, talking about Jesus teaches about the end times. Uh, this lesson is one of the uh, events, last events that Jesus uh, has with his disciples, one of the last major conversations he has with his disciples just prior to the upper room discussions um, prior, uh, at Passover. Uh, but he talks about uh, end time events. The next two Sundays will be uh, lessons 12 and 13 after this Sunday. So the, the, the 21st and the 28th of February will be lessons 12 and 13. And both of those two lessons will be dealing with the betrayal and trial of Christ next Sunday. And then the following Sunday will be uh, dealing with his death and his resurrection, his crucifixion and his resurrection. So uh, we are wrapping this uh, series of lessons up from the Gospel of Mark. The new quarterlies are in. Uh, I've sent most of you, you, I think I've sent you all an email uh, I've, I've heard a reply from some of you, uh, and I've been seeing some of you at church services on Wednesday and Sunday to distribute the new Sunday School quarterly. If you haven't gotten the email or you haven't heard that yet, uh, please uh, come by and <clears throat> excuse me and uh, uh, pick up your new quarterly. Uh, see me Sunday at church, and I can hand them to you as well, or uh, we can also. Um, a mail one to you if you're not uh, out and about just yet. So uh, let me know. Uh, we do have the new quarterlies available for you. Uh, the next quarterly, uh, we're going to be dealing with uh, two interesting topics. We're going to be talking about scriptures that are difficult to understand in the first session of lessons. And then uh, the latter portion of the quarter, we're going to discuss the letters and the writings of Peter and Jude. So uh, going to be, a, uh, I think, a very interesting series of lessons and studies. Uh, before we begin uh, today, uh, let me uh, make some general announcements. We still have the petition to stop the right to abortion amendment in Virginia. Uh, we have that uh, still in the lobby. If you're interested, you can sign the petition online um, and um, uh, we have it in our lobby as well. We also have Auto Bell Car Wash uh, and Cruise Through Car Wash gift cards available for DCA as a fundraiser. We still have the, uh, some of the Need Prayer door hangers available if you'd like to pick some of those up in the lobby and hang those out throughout your neighborhoods. Also remember that you can take your camera, you can scan the QR code that's located in the halls and bathrooms throughout the building and you can get the weekly bulletin that way as well. We, on Saturday, the 27th of February, we'll be offering our next membership class. And um, if you're interested in knowing more about who we are at WOW or joining uh, the local body, then, then we encourage you to come to the membership class on February 27th from 9 to 3. Uh, there is a capacity limit of 24 and a lunch will be provided. Child care is available if you need child care for up to age 12. There is a capacity limit in the nursery of five. Um, and so uh, if you are interested, please sign up online or you can sign up in the lobby. Also, CareNet Peninsula is looking to hire a full-time client advocate. And this is a position where you would be providing peer counseling uh, to women that are facing unplanned pregnancies, and you do so with the mercy and compassion of Christ. And so if you're interested in that, that appeals to you, please go to the CareNet website and apply online at cnpeninsula.org. And uh, that they would love to hear from you from there. Also, men, uh, those of you that are watching today, uh, the Conquer series for men will begin Saturday, March the 13th. We'll be launching a new men's discipleship uh, called the Conquer series. This is a great study on sexual purity of man and is designed to equip uh, men with an understanding of, of the waging war that exists 
for those who struggle with sexual addiction and or uh, the practical application tools to create an effective battle plan in that area. The books are $17 per person. This will be a Zoom platform for our virtual meetings monthly. And we will begin that, as I said, in March the 13th. Uh, and uh, if you have any more questions, uh, you can contact the church office or you can also visit uh, uh, our website and register online. We have several that we want to pray for today. We've, we've gotten word, uh, quite a few folks. We've got several folks that are sick. They're not COVID sick, but they're sick with other health needs. Um, some with upper respiratory infections and sinus problems and uh, uh, heart issues. And some have been hospitalized and visited emergency rooms and that kind of thing. And so uh, they're better and, uh, and some have gone home. We still have others in the hospital. When the Casto family, uh, she uh, is home from the hospital, uh, was uh, hospitalized because of COVID. Patrick now has it. Uh, he's at home, but he has also been diagnosed with COVID. So we want to pray for them and uh, pray for the marriage seminar uh, that's tomorrow, which will, by the time you see this, it'll have already occurred. But we have um, about 150 plus that are registered for the marriage seminar tomorrow. So that's, that's great. That's exciting. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the power and anointing of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father Lord, for your word, for your daily guidance and direction to us. Thank you, Father Lord, for your provision, meeting our needs, supplying, Father Lord, those things that we have need of. Thank you, Father Lord, for our spiritual covering. We thank you for life and life eternal. Father, through our relationship with you, we pray, Father, today that you would touch everyone that's on that prayer list. Father, the Casto family and others, Lord, that are dealing with COVID. Uh, Father, Lord, others that uh, are dealing with just general illness, but Lord, that are not COVID-related, some very serious. We just pray you touch uh, Lord, the, their bodies, that you would heal them. We pray, Father, Lord, for those that are dealing with heart issues, that you would uh, heal their bodies and strengthen them. We pray, God, that you would minister, Father, your word today as we go and uh, record this lesson. We pray, Father, that you would minister your grace and peace. Give us insight into your word today in our mind, in our hearts, Father, Lord, to receive the principles of this lesson. We, we pray, Father, Lord, we, we are living in the last days. We are living in Bible times. We are living in biblical days. And help us, Lord, with insight to the teaching of Christ that we see from the epistle of Mark, uh, the gospel of Mark and his writings in chapter 13 today. Give us insight, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. I'm going to take a drink of water here. All right, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Mark chapter 13. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 37 today, which is pretty much the entire chapter. And uh, we're going to see where Jesus is uh, discussing the end times. He's foretelling future events. And uh, in the lesson today, we're going to very specifically focus on one key doctrine of the Christian faith. And that is the second coming of Jesus Christ. So we know that the Old Testament provides a great deal of information and prophecy and indication of Christ's first coming. We, we can look on almost every page just about, and you see, we, you've heard the saying, you can see the scarlet thread uh, all the way through the pages of the Old Testament. We know that we have many indications, many prophetic words in the Old Testament about Christ's first coming. Well, the same can be true uh, in the New Testament, and we have much information in the New Testament that provides a foundation for the belief in Christ's second coming. So in Mark's Gospel, chapter 13, we see that it establishes the basis or the foundation of the hope of Christ's second uh, uh, coming. And notice that, that we, can, we, we know that we come and face adversity. Whatever adversity we may face as believers, we can embrace the hope that will ultimately give way to the return of Christ. And I, I, want, us to, I want to remind you that this hope is not wishful thinking. 
this hope is based on certainty. It's, it's a fact of knowledge, of information. Christ made a promise. We see God made a promise. He was going to send His Son, and that promise was fulfilled. And so now Jesus has returned and said that I will, He will return, that He would come back for His bride. And so we know that we have that promise, and we know that the first promise has been fulfilled. And based on that fact, we have hope that He will return again. And so this hope is not wishful thinking. Uh, we know that he, He's going to return. We know that He's going to establish His everlasting kingdom. And when He comes, then He wraps up all of that redemptive work and the purpose of His coming in the first place. Now, uh, notice on the board that I have a little box drawn, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. These are three chapters that are identified by a lot of the Christians as the little apocalypses the little apocalypses, uh, and that's because they deal with last day events. You, many of you have know Matthew 24, a long discourse on Jesus on end times. Mark 13 is where we are today. Luke 21 also discusses that. These are known as the little apocalypses. It also has another name. It's also referred to as Jesus' Mount of Olive Discourse. Mount Olivet Discourse. This is where he is sitting on the Mount of Olives overlooking the city of Jerusalem and he is teaching his disciples and he's teaching his disciples based on three questions that his disciples have asked him. Number one, when would the city of Jerusalem be destroyed? Number two, what would be the sign of his coming, his return? And number three, what would be the sign of the end of the age? And uh, if you go to uh, Matthew 24 real quickly, just flip a page or two back, uh, and you'll see Matthew 24, verse 3, it says, Later Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to Him privately and said, Tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? So Matthew 24, 3 is this, the, this, the, the uh, scripture location for those three questions I just gave you. So when we read and interpret chapter 13 of Mark, it really requires the ability to distinguish which of Jesus' answers apply to which question. And so we're going to do that today as we go through the Word. I'd like for us to read verses 1 through 4. So Mark 13 verses 1 through 4. As Jesus was leaving the temple that day, one of his disciples said, Teacher, look at these magnificent buildings. Look at the impressive stones in the walls. Jesus replied, Yes, look at these great buildings, but they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives across the valley from the temple. Peter, James, and John, and Andrew came to him privately and asked him, Tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will show us that these things are about to be fulfilled? So here we see, as repeated from Matthew 24, verse 3, as seen here in Mark 13, verse 4, we see they're asking, these disciples are asking. So, Prior to that conversation on the Mount of Olives, Jesus and his disciples had been in the temple. And as they were leaving, as Matthew tells us, as they were leaving the temple, one of his disciples said, look at these beautiful, magnificent structures, these buildings. Aren't they beautiful? And so Jesus, we see, was frequently in the temple. He taught in the temple. He not only taught in the synagogues, as we talked about in the last previous lessons, where he traveled all around the northern part of Israel in Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. He taught in the synagogues, but he also was frequent uh, in the temple in Jerusalem. And we see that they asked him a question and said, look at the magnificence of this structure, of this building. Well, Jesus' reply is that the temple would be completely destroyed, verse 2. And then shortly after that, he, Jesus and his disciples, after he says this, they walk across a short distance, and in another location it says a Sabbath day's journey. They walk out of the lower portion of the city. They cross the, the Kidron Valley and go up onto the Mount of Olives. 
And as Jesus and his disciples are overlooking the city of Jerusalem, Peter, James, John, and Andrew are asking these questions. When is the temple going to be destroyed? And uh, as we've already read, Matthew spells out a little more completely these three questions that I just read to you. So in the uh, time of Jesus, the temple was a very, very large, very impressive structure, the building of which was initiated by Herod the Great. Now, I've got to give you a little history here about the temple. The temple, Herod the Great's temple, he had expanded on it and built on it, but it included the uh, temple built by Zerubbabel after the Babylonian captivity. Now, the temple that was built by Zerubbabel was at the very heart of Herod the Great's temple. It is identified in the Gospels and the Acts, a book of Acts, by the Greek term naos, N-A-O-S. And that means it's a shrine or a sanctuary and the part of the temple where only the priests of Israel could go. So when you look at Herod the Great's temple that was in Jesus' day, the center portion of that was Zerubbabel's temple, and that was the portion where only the, Greek, the uh, Jewish priest would go. The entire temple, with all of its courts, its rooms, its porches, is identified by the Greek term herion, so you've got the inner sanctuary as naos, and the entire structure in the Greek word is called herion. So Jesus worshipped and taught in the herion, the, the full structure. He was in the outer structure, in the porches, in the other rooms. So he taught there, but he never entered into the naos. Okay? So Jesus had a very reverent regard for the temple. And remember, in Mark chapter 11, just two chapters back of where we are today, Jesus had drove from the temple those who had desecrated the temple by their activities of selling and buying and, and all of that. And, and we see that uh, to quell a rebellion against Rome by the Jews, the Romans completely destroyed the temple and the city of Jerusalem just 30 or 40 years after Jesus said this. So Jesus is talking, this is the last year of his life, it's around A.D. 30, he makes this prediction, and he says that the temple will not be standing one stone left upon another. Just 40 years later, the Romans destroy not only the temple, but they also destroy the city uh, in A.D. 70. So after this, Jerusalem remained in ruins, and was uninhabited for 60 years. So from A.D. 70 until uh, A.D. 130, Jerusalem was an uninhabited city. The Romans re uh, began to rebuild the city in A.D. 136. All right. To this day, the temple has never been rebuilt. Now, let's look at verse 5. So now Jesus is replying to those three questions asked in verse 4. Jesus replied, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in many parts of the world, as well as famines. But this is only the first of the birth pains, with more to come. Now, when these things begin to happen, watch out. You will be handed over to the local councils and beaten in the synagogues. You will stand trial before governors and kings, because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. For the good news must first be preached to all the nations. But when you are arrested and stand trial, don't worry in advance about what to say. Just say what God tells you at that time. For it is not you who will be speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Wow, can you imagine that? He tells them not to worry, that you don't have to pre-plan your thoughts, you don't have to figure out what you're going to say that the Holy Spirit is going to speak through you, give you the words to say. So now, in verses 5 through 11, Jesus is 
giving them the signs of the times that they had just asked for. So go back to verse 4. Tell us when all this will happen. So when will the temple be destroyed? What sign will show us that these things are about to, are about to be fulfilled? So now Jesus, in verses 5 to 11, answers those questions. So he's, they've made the inquiry. When is it going to be destroyed? He tells them to be on guard. Now notice the first thing he says before he answers the question is be on guard against deceivers who are going to come and call themselves the Messiah. Now notice this is kind of interesting. Jesus is talking to his disciples. Now he's physically present with them. Now this precludes the thought that Jesus won't be with them in that future. All right? And he's saying in the future days when these when the temple will be destroyed, I won't be here. In other words, he's talking about his death and resurrection. He won't be here. But he's also giving them a warning that before he returns, there will be many others that will come and say that he is the Christ, that they are the Messiahs. All right. Now, we know for a fact that secular history confirms that there have been many, many false messiahs before and after Jesus' earthly lifetime here on the earth. Jesus said the common troubles that have always been part of the sinful human condition will continue. In other words, in verse 7 and 8, he says you're going to see wars, earthquakes, and famines. But Jesus also said, in spite of all of these troubles, in verse 7 he says, but the end shall not yet be. All right, so notice what he says. But don't panic. These things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. So in verses 9, 10, and 11, Jesus addresses a more immediate concern for his disciples. He foretold the persecution that would come against his disciples after he departs from them. Okay? Now, they still had trouble wrapping their head around de Jesus' death. He'd been teaching now for about eight months that he was going to die. He said that they would be persecuted by the Jews, they would be delivered to councils, and beaten in the synagogues. So that specifically, those words give us indication where <clears throat> they would first experience persecution. They would experience the persecution from the Jewish religious leaders themselves. The councils would be the councils of the Jewish leaders, and they'd be beaten in the synagogues, which are a Jewish meeting place for instruction and fellowship. So they're gonna, they would also then, not only would they be treated uh, disrespectfully and persecuted by the, their own people, but they're also going to be persecuted by the secular rulers and kings. Now, Jesus is foretelling the future, but what we're really saying is that these are prophecies of Jesus, and we know that these prophecies came to pass between A.D. 30 and A.D. 63 as documented in the Acts of the Apostles. So if you take these signs, you look at Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, you look at the passages where he talks about that his disciples, are after he's gone, after his death and resurrection, his ascension back to the Father, after he's away from them and they're on the earth, they've been filled with the Holy Spirit and they're ministering, they're going to begin to feel persecution. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he's saying that these prophecies are going to be fulfilled in the very near future. And so we can actually then take these words of Jesus and compare them to the history of the church in the book of Acts. And we can see that Jesus' predictions about the, the prophecies and predictions of the future came to pass. Jesus said that these persecutions would not put an end to the gospel. He says that in verse 10. They can try. For the good news must first be preached to all nations. So they may try to snuff out God's word, but it will not be successful. According to Matthew, <clears throat> Jesus said in chapter 24, Matthew 24, verse 14, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. So we know that that time has not yet come because we are still preaching the message of Jesus Christ, the gospel of, uh, of Jesus Christ 
to unreached people groups. Now, each year, that number of unreached people groups, or what we call UPGs, is going, growing smaller and smaller. And that's something that the Church of God has developed in the last several years, is to finish the Great Commission. We could see in our lifetime all unreached people groups identified and reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, notice that Jesus <clears throat> assured his disciples that when they would be accused and questioned by their persecutors, that the Holy Spirit would give them the right words with which to answer their persecutors. Jesus was so emphatic about this that he said his disciples should not try to frame in their mind and in their hearts beforehand what they would say to their persecutors. Now, that's interesting to me, because if I'm going to preach, I'm going to teach, then I like to be prepared in advance. I, I, if I'm going to give a lecture, if I'm going to speak to somebody, or if I have a meeting where I'm pr making a presentation, I want to be prepared. And so I, I have notes, I've had an outline, you know, and notice that Jesus says that when you're persecuted, when you're standing before these accusers, you don't have to worry about framing or identifying or creating an outline of your thoughts. The Holy Spirit is going to do and uh, what he needs to do through you. He's going to give you the words to speak. There are very specific examples of the Holy Spirit giving Jesus' disciples words to say to their persecutors. Let me give you one example of that in Acts chapter 4. Look at verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus said the Holy Spirit would speak and tell them what to say. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. Wow. All right? That's just one example. Just one example of where Jesus' disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and, and they uh, knew by the Holy Spirit what to say to their persecutors. And there are many others. You can look in that same chapter. You can look at chapter 5 also and you find other locations. Now, let's go back for a moment to Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. We know that. Now, we've said that Mark 13 is where Jesus is giving his discourse or his teaching on the Mount of Olives or the Mount Olive Discourse. Now in Mark, uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, we're referring back to his Sermon on the Mount. Many people know about the Sermon on the Mount and they know the first 16 verses of chapter 5. But what a lot of people don't understand is that in that sermon on Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus also warned against excuse me, uh, deceivers. He said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly there are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. In other words, their actions. They may say one thing, but do another. This is in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 and 16. Trying to predict the time of Christ's coming again and when specific end-time events will occur is an area of inquiry where there is so much room to be deceived and to deceive others. We need to keep this in mind and not only be accepting of teachings, and not be accepting, excuse me, of teachings that cannot be clearly verified by the Holy Scripture. So what am I telling you? You may hear somebody say, well, did you hear uh, Jesus is coming back on this date and time in this location? All right. First off, Jesus doesn't even know when he's coming back, so how can your neighbor know it? All right? All right? Jesus himself says that the Father only knows that time. So don't be misled. Don't be deceived by false doctrines. Know your word. Know your scripture and be able to identify uh, falsehoods and false doctrines when they may come across your path. Now, in point number two, 
in Mark chapter 13, 12 through 31, Jesus talks about the signs of his return. And so let's, let's read uh, verses uh, 12 down through 23 quickly. A brother will betray his brother to death. A father will betray his own child and children will rebel against their parents and cause them to be killed. And everyone will hate you because you are my followers. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. The day is coming when you will see the, re- the sacrilegious object that causes desecration standing where he should not be. Reader, pay attention. Those, then those in Judea must flee to the hills. A person out on a deck or a roof must not go down into the house to pack. A person out in the field must not return even to get a coat. How terrible it will be for pregnant women and for nursing mothers in those days. And pray that your flight will not be in winter. For there will be greater anguish in those days than at any time since God created the world. And it will never be so great again. In fact, unless the Lord shortens that time of calamity, not a single person will survive. But for the sake of his chosen ones, he has shortened those days. And if then, if anyone tells you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it. Okay, so Jesus is being very specific here about signs of his return. Now, let's, let's think for a moment. When we think about signs, or the word sign, as used in this lesson, it usually means evidence of something present or something in the future. For example... A sign can be evidence of the character of the present time or of the approaching future conditions or events. So Jesus' disciples wanted to know what would be the sign that the destruction of the temple was nearing. What would there be some character of the evidence of that time approaching? In verses 12 and 13, Jesus continued speaking about the persecution of those who believe in him. But notice what he says. <clears throat> Excuse me. He gives them this assurance in verse 13. He said, he that shall endure. Another word, another word for that is he who will persevere unto the end shall be saved. Now notice in verse 14, Jesus began to give a very specific answer to his disciples' question about the signs of the temple's destruction. Now, Citing a passage from the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 27, Jesus said, When you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, Luke 21, 20, and Daniel's prophecy being fulfilled, it will be the time for the residents of Jerusalem to escape from the city. That's what he talks about in verses 14, 15, and 16. Most Christian scholars believe that in this instance, Jesus' mention of the abomination of desolation, verse 14, that we just read, is a prophecy about the Roman army's ensigns. An ensign is a flag okay, that would be raised in Jerusalem and in the temple. Now, the early church historian Eusebius says that all the Christians in Jerusalem heeded the prophecy of, Jeru- of Jesus and they escaped to the city of Pella, and that was about 65 miles north-northeast of Jerusalem before Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by the Romans in A.D. 70. Now Jesus goes on to tell what a terrible time it would be for the Jews in Jerusalem and Judea when Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed. And this was fulfilled just 40 years after Jesus said it. It would be a very especially cruel for pregnant women and those with infants, as he talks about in verse 17. As for the residents of Jerusalem, it would be a time worse than it had ever, ever been seen before, ever experienced by the Jews. And it's, again, referencing 18, 19, and 20. The historian Josephus tells us that 600,000 Jews perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. Thousands more were led away as slaves, and so many were crucified for miles around the city that there were no substantial trees to be found because they'd all been cut down to make crosses for crucifixions. Again, Jesus warned of deceivers 
in this instance, those who would be active among people leading right up to the destruction of Jerusalem and to the temple. Now, let's look at verses 24 through 31. At that time, after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with great power and glory, and he will send out his angels to gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. And he says, when its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things taking place, you can know that his return is very near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene before all these things take place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. So Jesus, in the previous verses, gave us signs of the temple's destruction. Now in verses 24 through 31, Jesus gives us signs of his second coming, his coming again. Verse 24 signals a kind of a shift, a major shift in his answers to his disciples here in this conversation. They had also asked about signs of his coming and signs of the end of the age. If you remember, we read that in Matthew 24, verse 3. Jesus, in these verses, responds to those two questions. In the questions that they asked him, uh, the questions about the signs of his coming and the, ends, uh, the signs of the end of the age, Jesus combines the answers of those two questions into one answer. He says the end of the age will not come until Christ comes again. Now, notice that this is consistent throughout the New Testament. The coming again of Jesus Christ and the end of the age are always related. They're always simultaneous or related events. Now, what about or, or what Jesus said about the signs of his coming and the end of the age is very much like what Joel the prophet said uh, about this in Joel chapter 2, 20, uh, 30, 31, Acts chapter 2, 19 and 20. Jesus said that when he comes again, his coming will be visible. It says the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. So it's going to be visible. Right? Notice we see that in also in Revelation chapter 1. Jesus said that when he comes, he will send his angels to gather to him all who belong to him from every part of the earth and heaven. Jesus said, when you see these things, you will know that the end of the age is at the doors. Jesus said the unbelieving sinful generation of humans would not pass away until the end of the age comes. Then Jesus said, heaven and earth in their present form will pass away. But he says, my words, his words will never pass away. Think about the time in which we live. We live in a time when many people who nominally identify themselves as Christians do not believe Jesus was actually the Son of God incarnate. They don't believe that he died. They don't believe that he rose from the dead, and they don't believe that he will ever come again. For these people, Jesus was a wise and good teacher, and Christianity is a religion that's devoted uh, to, to uh, social justice. All of this, of course, um, is really contrary. Think about this. For those people that don't believe He's the Son of God. They don't believe that He died. They don't believe He raised from the dead. They don't believe that he, He's coming again. They, they just see Him as a wise teacher, as a good teacher, a man. They think, you know, they're really devoted to humanism. They're really just uh, concerned about social justice. They don't see Jesus as the Son of God, the Son of Man. All right? They reject Him as that. And they just see Him as a good man. And so their thinking 
is really contrary to that of the Gospels. These facts accentuate the need for true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Gospel. And notice what Jude said in, in Jude chapter 1, verse 3. We need to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Notice, Jesus is encouraging us to do the same. In verses uh, 32 and 33, as we close this lesson, notice what he says. However, no one knows the day nor the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. And since you don't know when that time will come, be on guard and stay alert. Stay alert. So, the time of Jesus' return is unknown. If you have somebody that comes to you and says they know when it is, they're a liar. No one knows. Jesus doesn't even know. Only the Father knows. We know Christ will come again. But he taught very plainly that that day and that hour, nobody knows. Jesus said the angels don't know when he's coming. They don't know the end of the age when that will be. Jesus said that he didn't did not know the time of his coming again. Only God the Father knows that. Now, many have interpreted this to mean that Jesus during his earthly incarnation chose not to have the knowledge of when he will come again. However, we cannot be certain about what Jesus meant by this saying. It is a mystery beyond our comprehension. So seeing that no one knows when Christ will come again, we then should be very spiritually alert and prayerful, always prepared for his return. Let's read verses 34 down through 37. The coming of the Son of Man will be illustrated by the story, or can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. When he left home, he gave each of his slaves instructions about the work they were to do. And he told the gatekeeper to watch for his return. You too must keep watch. For you don't know when the master of the household will return, in the evening, at midnight, before dawn, or at daybreak. Don't let him find you sleeping when he arrives without warning. I say to you what I say to everyone, watch for him. Jesus is concluding his discourse, his teaching, to his disciples here on the Mount of Olives. And he tells them a parable that teaches that we should always keep ourselves prepared for his coming. The parable says that we need to go about our lives as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, doing the work in this world that Christ has given us to do. That's another way of saying occupy till he comes. But he also says that we are to live in faithfulness to him keeping ourselves spiritually pure, spiritually alert, spiritually prayerful. Very simply stated, we need to prepare ourselves for Christ coming again by living for Him as if He is our Savior and our Lord and soon coming King. For almost 2,000 years, Christians of Orthodox faith have been confessing that Jesus Christ ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there he shall judge the living and the dead. This is a phrase from the Apostles' Creed. This is still our confession of faith today. We still wait for Christ to come again. And whether he does or does not come in our lifetime, we must remain faithful to Him. Listen to what Romans 14 verses 8 and 9 says. For whether we live or whether we live unto the Lord or whether we die, we die unto the Lord. And whether we live therefore or die, we belong to the Lord. For this purpose Christ died, both died and rose and lived again, that He might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Today in our call to discipleship, no matter when we heard or heeded the call of the gospel to come and be a disciple of Jesus Christ, whether some of you it was many years ago or whether it was just last week, 
that calling still remains. It does not change. It's an unchanging calling. Our first and our permanent calling is simply to be real believers of Jesus Christ, and we are to wait patiently for His coming. So, my, my challenge to you today, my encouragement to you today, is to consider and follow through with the things that uh, might, you might do to keep yourselves more constantly aware of that blessed hope of Christ's return. In other words, encourage yourselves. Stay in the Word of God. Stay in prayer. Be in fellowship with other believers. Encourage them and be encouraged by them. So, Father, we thank you for uh, this lesson today. We thank you for the power of your Word. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask, O oh God, that you would take, Lord, Lord, we are living in the last days, and, and uh, we are seeing some of these things unfold before our eyes. Give us the strength and the courage, Father, to stand for Christ. We give you praise and glory and honor. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. All right. Lord bless you. We'll see you next week.